significance of what Essence did today when she went public in her faith through water baptism. That's when the church rejoices. And that's when we celebrate victory. Amen. I hope that uh, your February has gone great. Isn't it crazy? It's almost March. What in the world? Someone really likes March Madness. All right, let's jump into God's Word. I'm so excited for today. Man, I just can't tell you, uh, I just can't tell you seriously how significant um, what God is doing here at Victory City Church. It's beyond me. It's beyond any individual. Um, Just the stories that we keep hearing from people who, young and old, new and been coming here forever, God's just moving in a really incredible way and uh, stories of, man, I've been looking for a church and I found my faith, man, you know, I kind of had given up on church, but I came here, man, I, I, I've been going to church for so long and then it kind of got stale, but man, God's doing something fresh in my life. I mean, we continue to hear stories like this and maybe you're here and you're going, well, I wish God would do it in me. He will. He will. He will. He will do it in you as well. And um, just stay faithful with him. Um, and I know God will move in your life. Well, uh, I'm excited about today. We're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. So pull your Bibles out. And we're going to read just a few verses here, 10 through 17. And uh, this is Paul writing to young Timothy. He says this, You, however, have followed my teachings, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra which persecutions I endure, yet from all the Lord has rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Watch out. Let me read that again for all the people. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be, not might be, not possibly could be, but will be, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through um, through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, all Scripture is God breathed. Uh, uh, breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. I'm excited. We got week four in Don't Catch the Isms. This morning we're going to be talking about progressivism. And I titled my message today, Don't Play-Doh. Don't Play-Doh. Y'all get it? No? They need to spell don't play dumb. Leave it up there. I thought it was really clever. I go, don't play dumb. The alternate title, if you like alternate titles, is the Bondo Bible. Bondo Bible. If you know cars and body work, you'll understand that. If not, just stick with don't play dumb. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray in Jesus' name that you would speak to our hearts, those who are faithfully following you, those who are trying to figure you out. God, I pray that you would uh, give me the clarity of mind. God, I pray that in, in, in the sense that I could get out of the way so that, God, your word would be heard. Father, I pray that people forget about me but remember you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can take a seat. Let's jump into God's word. Let's move through this efficiently. Um, every time you go to prepare a message, you're, you're always thinking this one feels different. It feels unique. It's like a child. You love them all, but you understand that they're all different. And uh, so uh, this one, uh, I'm, I'm excited. I know what God's going to speak, but this one may be something where we have to apply a little bit of academic critique and thought. And I want to jump into that, uh, beginning with uh, Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl uh, has been in the news recently 
uh, both because of his literary works and because some of his literary works has been turned into movies. If you don't know the author's name, Roald Dahl, you might know some of his works. He wrote the book called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. How many of you guys remember Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? He wrote uh, James and the Giant Peach. James and the Giant Peach. How many of you guys remember reading these as kids, right? He wrote BFG. Um, and he wrote uh, Matilda. That's been turned into a movie recently, a remake. Uh, Roald Dahl is a very prominent children's author and wrote uh, quite a few books. And Roald Dahl was no saint. Um, but he's recently come into the news because Roald Dahl's literary works uh, are being edited. Um, they're taking it through what's called a process of making it culturally more inclusive. And so uh, current uh, academics and people who write uh, books, well, they actually don't write their own books. They just edit other people's books, are um, taking Roald Dahl's literary works and saying, hey, you know what? There's just some language in these books that need to be updated to be more culturally inclusive. And so they're changing different words, like they're not going to use mother and father anymore. They're going to use parent. Um, uh, in fact, one of the characters in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, it said he was fat. They're not going to use fat anymore. They're going to use um, large. Um, they're basically going to update because they're, they're saying, hey, some of the words that Roald Dahl used, um, they, they just don't fit our modern culture anymore. And I'm not here to really debate uh, the pros and cons of that practice. Um, but more, more really what I'm trying to get at is that the critics of this debate are saying this, hey, listen, here's the deal. You begin to change the words, you change the ideas, you change the ideas, you change the characters, you change the ideas, the words, and the characters, and you change the author's original intent in writing the book. And how do we know that the words that we're going to begin using now are going to be appropriate 50 years from now? And then if they change it again in 50 years, how do we know that what Roald Dahl started to write is still going to be what he wanted to write if it continues to evolve and change? This ism is called progressive-ism. You see, this updating isn't just happening in children's novels, but there's a significant desire to update the Bible to more culturally inclusive language. This is progressivism, which to summarize progressivism is the belief that the Bible and Christianity need an update. The language needs revision. The ideas need to be revised. Um, the truth that the Bible claims need to be, needs to be changed to become more inclusive. Come on, how many of your phones, you will, <coughs> excuse me, get an update where it says, hey, your phone needs an update. And you got to update the thing, and then you got to plug it in. It downloads. Come on, anybody have to update their phones, right? And then when you update your phone, it looks different. And you're like, wait, where do my apps go? What is, that doesn't look the same, all those types of things. Um, and then you see somebody with a really old phone, and you're going, man, that just looks old and busted. And like, why are you still operating? And they're like, well, if I update, my phone won't work anymore. Um, and the challenge we have today and the challenge that we're facing is progressivism. And let me just tell you really quick, progressivism is seeping into the church. It's seeping into the church, and it's seeping into Christians. And what it is, is we've been talking about this idea of don't catch the isms because that many believers, because we live in a fallen world, we catch isms. Just like we would catch colds or viruses or um, bacteria and we become sick or ill, we, our body doesn't function as well, we catch isms. We catch cynicism. We catch racism. We catch individualism. And if we're not careful and don't be diligent, we're not diligent in this, we'll catch progressivism. And progressivism is this idea that, that the Bible is antiquated and therefore needs to be updated and its words need to be changed, its ideas need to be changed. And really the key verse for our whole series is this idea right here where it says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to obey Christ and the key thought, the key kind of preaching point or truth that I want you to capture after five weeks of ism is that our ism will keep us from being shaped into his image. The challenge with progressivism can be connected to Plato. You guys, you guys, your kids play with Plato. Did you play with Plato? 
The challenging thing is that anytime you mixed Play-Doh, uh, how many of you guys, all your Play-Dohs just became brown, right? It became just like, it lost all the color. Um, and you were like, well, I wanted to do some cool swirl thing. And how many of you guys, you had, you had the little Play-Doh thing where you would put it in the thing and you would squeeze it and it would make spaghetti. And you loved it. You were like, look, it's spaghetti. And then you would get like, you'd make a little pizza and you'd have like a little cutter and you'd make the things. And how many of you guys, you had, you would lay your Play-Doh out and then you would have the little molds that you would cut your Play-Doh with. And you're like, look, I made a star. Look, I made a circle. I made a square. And your kids were like, they were, had, they were so, it was so much fun. Um, but then sometimes you would leave the cap open to the Play-Doh and what would happen to the Play-Doh? It'd dry out. It would dry out. The challenge with progressivism is, is progressivism tells you that the Bible is Play-Doh and you are the mold. Rather than orthodoxy, which tells you, no, 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 the Bible is the mold and you are the Play-Doh. You see, we live in a culture that basically says this, hey, we, we get to shape the Bible as if it's Play-Doh and the mold is what we want. The mold is the truth that I want it to be. And, and so therefore, because I am the mold and the Bible is the scripture, or excuse me, the scripture is the Play-Doh, until I can shape the Bible to my own mold, um, I'm going to struggle to believe rather than submitting to the fact that this, that, that this piece of literature literally has lasted thousands of years, unchanged. I was actually talking to a friend on the golf course this past weekend, and he was on, you know, I've been kind of talking through my faith, and I've been thinking through some things and on the authenticity and the historicity of the Bible, and how can I believe it? And I go, have you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? And he goes, no, I haven't heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I was like, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls are, are original text or close to original text that were found in the um, near the Dead Sea in the desert in Israel, and two Bedouin farmers were throwing rocks into caves, these little boys, and they hit a pot in, inside the cave, and they went in, and they found uh, uh, really handwritten uh, versions of the Bible. You had the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah, you had the Gospels, and they had these original texts, and, and all these um, Textual critics came in and they said, ah, now we're going to catch the Bible. We're going to see that the Bible has been manipulated by human hands and we'll be able to prove that the Bible is nothing but a work of man and it's not really God's work. But what they found out is that in a gap of nearly 1,700 years, the accuracy was 99.7%. They said this. They said the only changes in 16 to 1700 years was a few pieces of punctuation. So something that has lasted centuries is now being faced in our modern society with being edited, changed, manipulated. Let me introduce this idea of orthodoxy to you. Orthodoxy, I know you might think Eastern Orthodox, but orthodoxy is basically this explanation. It is to conform to established doctrine, especially religion. And what you have is a battle between progressive Christianity and Orthodox Christianity. Not Eastern Orthodox Church, but Orthodox meaning that we conform to established Doctrine, truths. We uh, conform to what the Bible has been teaching for centuries. And that's why one of the things that we do regularly at Victory City Church is we say the Apostles' Creed. We confess truths that disciples have been saying for centuries. And while you see a modern expression of a church, the message of the church really must remain sacred and ancient. But we don't like that. We live in a society that wants to always be progressing, and if we're not progressing, we're falling behind, and all the new stuff is the best stuff, right? If it's new, it must be better. Come on, everybody thought that smartphones were going to be amazing, right? I mean, and they are. Like, it's cool that I can pay with my smartphone. It's cool that I can check emails with my smartphone. I think it's so funny, though, that now after about 20 years of smartphone, there's going, hey, what we really need to do is just go outside. (laughs) 
wow, that is revolutionary. Isn't it funny? Like if you're in your 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, and above, and all that kind of stuff, like the things that you did as a kid, now these next generations are like, there's something so crazy. Have you all thought about just like vitamin D? But new is better, right? New is better. Like, oh, this is going to help us be connected. We're going to be able to be connected to everybody, but yet we're more alone than we were forced to when we had to talk to our neighbors. Do you all know your neighbors? Are you kind of like weird guy? Literally, my kids think the neighbors behind us are vampires. <laughs> Literally. Because they never see them. And a ball will go over the fence, and they're like, no, they're, they're, they're vampires. They really are. I'm not going over. They never come out. They never come out. I never have seen them. New is better, isn't it? Paul writes to Timothy. He says this, but as for you, continue. Listen to this. Continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it. Paul is explaining to Timothy, who is a young pastor in a Roman Greek society where there is tremendous pressure to adjust Scripture. Paul's saying, no, 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 continue in what you have learned, knowing from who you have learned it. You see, progress is not bad. As a church, we want to progress. We want to reach more people. We want to be more effective in our ministry. We want to move forward, but not all progress is good. Progressivism is the belief that the message of the Bible needs to evolve. The rules need to change. The boundaries need to move back. Progressivism is basically this. I want to sleep with who I want to, and I want the Bible to affirm it. God bless you this morning. We're so thankful you're here. <laughs> what it does is it provides a veneer of Christianity without actually being Christian. And you see, the only people who really like progressive Christianity are former Christians. Lost people, really lost people, like people who are for real lost. They could care less about any version of Christianity. They're doing what they want to because they want to. They, do need a, not, they don't need a God to tell them it's okay. The only people who really struggle with progressive Christianity are former Christians. Because they have a residue of God guilt. They have just enough awareness... To know that there is a force beyond themselves, but yet they still want what they want. You see, if you're totally lost, do you remember my lost people? Like, absolutely lost. And you talked about Jesus, they rolled their eyes and like, whatever, bro, that's where you, I don't really care. But it's this middle ground. That's like, I, I, I know enough about the Bible and God and hell and heaven and all that kind of stuff, but I still, what I want, I still what, want what I want. So how can I manipulate the big guy in the sky to approve what I'm doing? My dad uh, worked on cars, and, and one of the things he would teach me, especially when cars were still made of pretty much metal. Now there's fiberglass and carbon and all these different things. And uh, one of the things he used to talk about, he said, anytime you're looking for a car, you should walk around and just knock on the car, like with your knuckles. Just knock on the body panels hit around it, and make sure the sound is consistent. Oh, that'll preach. Make sure the sound is consistent. Ding, 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 ding. Make sure it sounds like metal because there's this something called Bondo. And Bondo is putty that basically was designed to be used for minor cosmetic errors where you'd put a little Bondo on it, you'd smooth it out. It's kind of like plaster on your drywall, except for metal. But what uh, machine shops and body shops began to figure out is this, is that as rust ate away at the car or there was massive dents, it was easier to just put a whole lot of Bondo on it, cover it up, paint it, and call it good rather than replacing the actual 
piece of the car. And so as you would walk around the car, you would hear metal, tink, 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 boom. And suddenly there would be something plastic or thud-like, and you're going, hang on, that's not, that's not metal. That's something different. And structurally, the car was weaker. There would be little warps in the body paint, but what they would do is they would take the Bondo, put it over a hole, and then they would sand it all the way down, and then they would spray it with paint, and it looked like a car. This is progressive Christianity. And you see, we all carry it in certain degrees. Some of us are sold out to the idea of progressivism, and some of us carry it in spots in our life, just like the flu, you could have different symptoms. You could be on the different arc of infection. Progressive Christianity, ultimately, I want you to hear this, is a stopping point on the way to post-Christian. You see, if we cannot trust all of the Bible, I shouldn't be able to trust any of the Bible. I want you to really think, like, think about, like I said, think about that. Like, let, let's use logic, let's use some academic, let's lean into this, let's come critically look at this. If I can't trust all of it, why should I trust any of it? Because the parts of the Bible that I don't trust now will be different years later. And so, therefore, if I cannot completely sell out to go, I believe in the whole Bible, we really shouldn't believe any of it. I think it's kind of like C.S. Lewis when he says this, with Jesus, there's no middle ground. He is either a lunatic and a liar, or he is Lord. There's no middle ground. I mean, the things that the Bible says about itself, you really can't fall in this middle ground. Like the text that we're reading today, uh, Paul says this, all Scripture, all Scripture is breathed out by God. All of it. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you're going, okay, Pastor Eric, um, I wouldn't call myself someone who's struggling with progressivism. Okay, and I would say, cool, praise God for you, I love you. But, but the challenge is that this is a real thing uh, that's threatening our world and it's something that you're facing on a regular day. In fact, um, old school preachers used to say you need to preach with the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in another. Meaning you've got to preach with like ancient truths, but yet you've got to make it historically appropriate. Now, I would say like you don't really have to preach with a newspaper because people don't read newspapers anymore. Now you have to reach with a, preach with a Bible in one hand and like YouTube in the other. Or Instagram or Facebook if you're over 50. And... I'm teasing. Actually, you guys want to know something really funny? It's not in my notes. I don't even know why I'm saying this. We ran one ad for the first time the other day, and uh, our church ads performed really well with women over 65. <laughs> so I don't know what that tells us about. I don't know. Okay, back to my notes. I don't know how to take that out. I don't know why I said that. Remind me, please, not to go into that on the 11 o'clock. <laughs> There's three things that often lead us to progressivism, and I want to walk, walk you through this really quick. The first one is this, is that we experience pain and hurt from the church. Pain and trauma uh, happen in the church, um, and it happens usually to people who live in error to Scripture. But the problem is, is you maybe grew up in an extremely fundamental, fundamentalism, religious, legalistic church who did not understand the balance between God's Word and love. And so because you were erring, you were, you were living outside of God's Word, but you maybe grew up in a church that didn't know how to love you well, and so you were beat over the head with the Bible, Rather than lovingly shown, here's what God says. Now, here's the thing. I've walked through a lot of people where I've loved them really well. And at the end of the day, they're just going to do what they want to do. Right? Like, I, I can't, the idea that I can love people into the kingdom is, is only partially true. 
You know people in your life that you love them deeply, you pray for them, and at the end of the day, they're just going to do what they want to do. But, but pain and trauma was created because you were a part of a church, and, and maybe you had a loved one, or you maybe experienced it yourself where you were living outside of God's design, and you were beat up for it. Like, maybe not physically, but you were, you were hurt, and you were basically thrown out of the church. Um, rather than lovingly walk through Scripture and helping to understand. And what that did to you was you were going, I want nothing to do with whatever feels like that. So you said this, I don't want boundaries. I don't want authority. I'm, I'm very wary of people in power because I was harmed by people who were in authority and power. And what you want to do is you really want to go, you want to find places that feel safe but may not actually be safe. Um, because, because a structure and a people group without boundaries really is anarchy. And you know, any place w- with anarchy feels fun in the beginning, right? Until the humanness starts showing up, and then it turns into chaos. You all remember Chaz in Portland or Seattle, where it was the autonomous zone, where they were like, we're creating our own country, and we're going to like have peace and love and no rules. You guys remember this during COVID and you saw all the videos? And like they would interview people and they were like, hey, listen, we are, we're an autonomous zone where the U.S. government has no rights. And they started creating, and it's all like free love and uh, like all the social causes and all that kind of stuff. And for like a week, it was really good. And then it went like absolutely downhill and like women were being raped, drug abuse or murders. I mean, it was crazy because it was absolute chaos. And here's what happens when we, when we make really important decisions in our life and we only view it through the lens of pain, right? And, and not only that, I would say, church, this is why we have to be really wise with how we love people. Like we have to hold truth in tension with love. Look at Jesus when he was with the woman who had committed adultery. He says this, I give you grace, but go and sin no more. Meaning we can love people well, but yet have a boundary. And so so for many of us, we lean into progressivism because of past pain and trauma. And anytime there's a rule or a boundary, we go, whoa, I don't like that. I think the second reason why people drift into progressivism, and this is really good just to evaluate yourself, is this, you have a low view of Scripture. And I say that lovingly. You have a low view of Scripture. The Bible is really this incredible, incredible piece of work that can speak to the most simplest of minds, but yet can confound the greatest of academics. It, it's, it's like it's cookies are on the bottom shelf. We're like, okay, I can be encouraged, but yet the depth of Scripture is something that mankind will never tap because it is incredibly deep. And many of us, we read Scripture like a textbook. But really, Scripture should be read like a novel. Because when you read a novel, you are looking for signs that the author is giving you that lead you to an end. So when you read To Kill a Mockingbird, when you read The Great Gatsby, when you read uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, when you read these books, you look for inferences and foreshadowing because you know that there is an author trying to lead you to a destination. And many of us, we read the Bible like a textbook. And therefore, when we see things that sometimes don't line up or don't agree because we have a low view of Scripture... We don't understand the complexity that really lays within it. And so what we end up doing is we begin to edit for ourselves. And look what Paul says. He says this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from who you've learned it. Here's what I, I want to say for all my believers. Let me just give you a pastoral warning. I am very skeptical, healthy, not cynical, skeptical, on YouTube and Facebook prophets who are not attached to a church. Because all they're doing is trying to pastor you through clickbait. Look at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was never a rogue evangelist. 
he was always a church planter that took on the role of the apost uh, an apostle. You have to consider your sources. And if I'm always taking in scriptural diets from these just kind of independent prophets who have these ministries that are not collect connected to a local body, that is a red flag. Well, they give me really cool insights. They talk about end times. They talk about prophetic things. Yeah, they also thought Trump was going to win 2020. Can we go there? Can we do that? Now, I'm not saying they're evil. But you must consider your source. And I would always lean into a person or a teacher who is connected to a local body. Because there's accountability there. Because I have to walk in that lobby every single Sunday and I have to stare you in the face. I don't just look at comments. There's an accountability to leading and walking and doing life with people. Here's the crazy thing. I know where your pain is. So you've got to begin to consider your sources. Let me give you another warning. I got 10 minutes left and a lot of message. Can't do it. Oh, Lord. Beware of people who have new revelation on truth. The Bible has been preached for thousands of years, and now you have a new interpretation? That this is not orthodox. What I am telling you today may be packaged differently, but the truth is the same for thousands of years. And that is that this word is infallible. That this word is all scripture and it is God breathed. I am not new in my new ideas. I may tell a unique story. I may come at it from a different angle. But I am still at the very end of the day saying this. I have to believe all of this or I cannot believe any of it. Third. Is this is what pushes us to progressivism. We meet nice individuals who have bad ideology. If you grew up in the church like me, you thought sinners were demons. Really. You know, like your mom probably told you, oh yeah, they listen to Tupac, they're going to they're gonna go to hell. <laughs> if you smoke a cigarette, you are going to, come on, how many of you guys grew up, if you, if you taste beer, you are going to hell. And then you turn 21, you're like, this kind of tastes very good. If you have sex, you will catch an STD immediately. Come on, how many of you guys grew up like this? Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Come on, give me some comfort. And so here's what happens to really good Christian kids. Here's what really good Christian kids, they, they go out into the world, they go to college. And they meet really lovely people who have bad ideology. And the first thing they think is the Bible and my church must be wrong. Like, he's gay, and he really loves Jesus. God has created mankind, me and you, in his image. So you are going to see glimpses of really lovely people. Where we have to begin to use the wisdom is to separate and go, I can see the individual who God has made them to be, and I can recognize the bad ideology that they possess, and I can hold the two things in tension, and I can say, I love you, but I don't agree with this. And I don't have to accept both of them to love you. And this is where, this is where really well-meaning Christians get in error, is because they go, but they're so one, they're, they're lovely. Great. That's awesome. Love them, pray for them, plead with them. But I have to separate the two. I have to see the person who God has breathed life into and see the sin who's the enemy, who, uh, that the enemy is using to destroy. I have to see both of them. 
Now, it's really all in how we approach the Bible. I'm going to close here because it's too quick. I'm going to have to jump in. Yeah. It's all in how we approach the Bible. Um, and here's what I want, you to, I, want to, I want you to consider, and then we're going we're gonna to talk about a few things. You have to ask yourself, is the Bible the inspired word of God, or is it the inspiring word of God? It's different. Again, remember, let's, let's lean in critically. Is it God breathed the inspired word of God, or is it just inspiring? Is the Bible just the greater Shakespeare? Or is the Bible truly God's revealed truth to mankind? And for some of you who lean into progressivism, listen, I love you. I can see the individual, and I can see the bad ideology, and I can separate them. The danger in progressivism is this, is that culture changes. And what may, may be culturally appropriate today may change, and something in 30, 40, 50 years, it may be different. What we have to do is we have to lean into what the Scripture says. We have to lean in and, and trust, trust the Word of God. It says this, that the Bible teaches us, the Bible reveals wrong teaching, the Bible corrects us, and the Bible equips us. And so here's what I want you to, I want you to get down to, and then we're going to talk about this, and I'm going to show you in a really uh, interesting way. When you read the Bible, you are going to come at some point where the Bible disagrees with a uh, certain ism, lifestyle, belief system, some behavior that you have in your life. You read the Bible long enough, and there'll be something that says, hey, you and the Bible disagree. Here's a really safe bet. Anytime you and the Bible disagree, let me just encourage you with this, and I'm going to say this lovingly. Just go ahead and assume that you're the one that's wrong. Rather than believing that this, this revealed, inspired word of God who the Holy Spirit worked through multiple people to compile this perfect work is the one that's wrong. Like, just go ahead and, and, and this, this takes humility. It's going to be uncomfortable. Your friends aren't going to agree with it. Your sorority, your fraternity, your workplace. All the really intelligent people that have master's degrees, th there's going to be persecution. Assume you're the one that's wrong. And that takes humility. And the challenge with progressivism, Isaac, come on and help me here for a second. The problem with progressivism is that we don't like boundaries. We don't like people telling us what to do. We don't like things. We don't, we don't, we don't like it. And so we want to free ourselves. We want to free ourselves from constraints. And here's what we do, we call it freedom. We call it freedom when, when there's no boundaries, when there's no structure, when, when I can do what I feel. But the problem is, is that's, that's like a lesser version of freedom. And so, so here you have a guitar. Um, I'm about to mess this guitar up temporarily. We're not going to do anything structurally to it. But in this guitar you have, you have the neck, you have the body. What are these called? The bridge, what's that called? The end of the guitar, okay, cool. Uh, and then you have these things, what do these things do? Tuning. Tuning. Here's the thing, sometimes God will tune you, which means he tightens you, he stretches you. But he does that to get a song out of you. But here's the thing, many of us, we want to be free, right? So I'm going to put this on here. I'm freeing it, stop, shh, it's okay. Is it good? All right, am I popping you? Okay. Look, guys, it's free. It's free. Well, not yet. Hang on. Now it's free. Now it has no boundaries, no structure. It can do what it wants.
throw this in the trash. Not that people are trash. But you see what happens when you, when you stop putting boundaries and structure in your life? Is that, that we think we're freeing ourselves, but we're actually liberating ourselves from the one who loves us and can get a song out of us. Because here's the beautiful thing, because now I have a, another guitar. It's, uh, it's uh, by way of uh, camera thing. Okay. You see, but when we're in the structure of God's word, and, and he tunes us, and, and only in the hands of a skilled musician, Isaac is God. Not really, but for the analogy. So, so whose hands are you in? And whose structure have you placed yourself in? And are you willing to stretch? Oh, God, he's tuning me. <clears throat> he's tuning me, and, and it pulls me tighter. Now, legalism is where he twists and twists until you snap. That's not what a good musician knows. But, oh, yep, that's it. That's, that's enough. That's too far. I don't, I'm not taking you too far. And then when we, place, when we place our hands in the hands of a skilled musician, you and I, suddenly God can get a song out of us. And then collectively, together, suddenly we become a chorus of truth and love and grace to people. But the only way that happens, church, is we remain in what we have been taught. For we know who has taught us. And we can say, he is Lord, he is truth, and his scripture has revealed it to me. And when I come to God, when I come to God, I'm going to go ahead and assume I'm the one that's wrong. And I'm going to submit myself to his word. And in his hands, he'll get a song out of me. And here's the crazy thing. I can play every song known to man by acoustic guitar. Like here, like how many songs can you play on acoustic guitar? I don't know, thousands and thousands and thousands. Do you see the freedom there? Because now that guitar is free to play any song. So what are you today? I'm free. Or are you free? Let's pray. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would speak to every heart. God, you would reveal your truth right now. And Father, whatever degree of progressivism we find our hearts and ourselves, Lord, I pray you would speak in Jesus' name. That, Lord, you would reveal and sell. That, God, that, that we would do something that's unfortunately considered old-fashioned today, and that's this. That's repent which is to turn in the direction that we were going and turn towards you. God, I pray that there would be people here that would humbly repent, that would ask for your forgiveness. And God, I know that you are faithful and good and that you are ready to come with grace and peace and mercy and love right in that moment. And God, I pray you do. Well, God, I pray for the unbeliever today, the, the doubter, the skeptic, the cynic. God, I pray for that person who has never surrendered their life to you. Or God has not, and it's been many, many years, and they've walked away from you. And maybe they're just coming back to you. God, I pray that they would do that today. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I, I just want to invite you to make Jesus Lord of your life. I, I invite you to get into the guitar and allow the Lord to begin to tune you, to get a song out of you. But you have to surrender your life. You have to make Jesus Lord of your life. You have to bend the knee at his throne and it comes through the form of prayer isn't it beautiful that the God of the universe just wants to talk to you he doesn't need overt signs he doesn't need you to perform he just needs you to speak confess and this morning that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed would you just on the count of three right where you're at if you're somebody who's saying yes to Jesus just right there one two three just slip your hand up and I want to pray with you yep praise God yeah, praise God. Praise God. Anybody else? Yep, I see you. Praise God. Yep, I see you in the back. Amen. See you in the middle. Praise God. See you in the back. Praise God. 
one of you have your hand up just one more second. All right, you guys can put it down. Church family, we've had a number of people raise their hands, and we can give God thanks for this, but will you pray with me? Will you pray with me? Praise God. Will you just say this together? Just say, Jesus, today I surrender my life to you. Jesus, I invite you into my heart. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, forgiving me of my sins, and giving me life eternal. Today, Jesus, I name you Lord, I name you Savior, and I name you King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, listen, hold on. I know, I know we want to celebrate, and I love that. I love that spirit of our church. Let me just give some instruction. If you raised your hand, we want to put God's word in your hands. You may have a Bible. You may have access to a Bible. Great. There's nothing wrong with two. Please, uh, on your way out, there's going to be ushers at the door. Will you please take one of the Bibles? We actually don't count hands. We count Bibles because that's the win is putting God's word in your hands. And in that Bible, there's a card just with some basic. We'd love some basic information. We don't want to pester you. Don't want to bother you. We want to celebrate with you and provide you a next step. Will you take just a moment, fill that card out, hand it to somebody at your blacktop tables, or if you just don't want to because you're socially awkward, you can drop it in a giving box right in the lobby. You'll see it. Hey, I love you, church. Come on, can we celebrate all those who said yes to Jesus?